Hello there everyone and welcome back to TNO The Last of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Guangdong Lover, but we're back here at episode 3 of uh, us playing as Komaki and Shiro, but cutting every cost. Excuse me, a group of surveyors and a Nissan lawyer stand below a gr fine green net, a story above them held by metal poles. We should remove the nets. Are you serious? A surveyor looks at the lawyer, concern sprawl over, all over his face. They'll save not only that, but they're cheap to maintain. Why bother with removing the... Another interjects. Listen, gentlemen, I have after me. I would not remove these nets. I'm only following orders from above. Murder, murmurs of disagreement are heard from some of the group as they cross their arms. What possible reasons are there to remove them? Silence, and the lawyer speaks once more. It's legal and any unnecessary cost, such as the maintenance of these nets, he points above himself, must be removed. The surveyors blink for a moment, and what about the workers who will die from this decision, one asks. Eh, replaceable. The medi lawyer immediately answers, his voice monotone, we're not having a shortage of labor. The surveyor opens and closes his mouth. Nothing would be done if this argument continued. By the evening, nothing separated air and hard earth. Very nice. Uh, we could also introduce curfew. Or blood-soaked metal. We want more growth. The opulence and magnificence of the pearls of the Guangdong are defined by the steel founders of the industry. Industry serves as the essential component of the economy and livelihood of the state. An attempt to hinder the industry is akin to seditious behavior against one's own administration. A town has been a proud and withstanding embodiment of the power and profits of a productive and substantial industry. Our managers focus and focused, our workforce diligent, our assembly lines active and operating at any moment. Of course, as prudent and righteous overseers of the nation, we do not interfere, will not interfere with, or block the everlasting strive for increased profits and progression. Our chief executive's intelligent approach to the management of one of Guangdong's fundamental institutions is undoubtedly a large contributor to its prosperity and success, allowing our earnest workforce to represent the prowess of Guangdong's influence working assiduously day and night, the true heroes of manufacturing. A nation's prosperity is not granted, it is earned, for the tunnels of the mines and the conveyor belts of the factories are what brings prosperity to us. Absolutely. Better anti-tank, what's not to love? We can blow up enemy tanks even faster now. It is 1968, everybody. Hope you're having a great year. Uh, what are we going to research next? Trucks? Look at some of this. Oh, withered ba Bauhinia. Ching Sung walked along the Pearl River with a government lanyard hanging in his hand. What of hundreds to be recalled? By order of the new chief executive, widespread cuts were being made to the civil service, especially in the departments responsible for building standards and uh, inspections. Rural clerics, son included, were the first to go. Today was his last day, and son decided he was better off arriving late. He wanted to clear his head on the riverbank, so that he would walk into the office at peace. A soft breeze swayed the lanyard in his hand. He pulled it up, looking at the attached ID card. Was it even his? The face on the card, that was his, but that name? Yas Yaus uh, Yuasa Wataru? Who was he now but a jobless fool? Son laughed at the fool on the car. They all told me that being you would be easier than being me. They all said Wat Wataru had a better chance here than Son ever would. In anger and defiance, perhaps in instability, he threw the lander into the river like a live grenade. He landed with a dull thud and a little splash and sank into the river. Wataru was gone now. There were only Chung Son, a man with no income, no little savings, and a wife to whom he didn't know how to explain this. What would he do now? What use would Guangdong have for him? He was over 40, a clerical worker all his adult life, and he was Chinese. To the south rose the Three Pearls. His appreciating class was moving south, where Hitachi had plenty of good jobs, so did the Chinese. Of course, it was risky, and he knew it. The standards of those factories were poor, working conditions were worse. Hitachi would hire someone there, it would be an industrial accident. A week later, they would hire someone new, and on and on, it's like it went. Cheng Sun was smart. He thought he could probably last more than a week. Cab did not work hard enough. No more corruption. The submission of order. Ooh, look at the stability. Ooh. But we already have something in the let go. Cattle do not work hard enough. The workers are the backbone of a thriving industrial force, of course. <clears throat> they comprise the numbers that push Guangdong towards an efficient and glorious future. It is of no doubt to us that in order for the nation to fully prosper, fully truly prosper, the work needs to be at optimal productivity. However, due to the mass calculations, the lackluster management of our apathetic and utterly incompetent predecessors, the most diligent and assiduous workforce has largely been degraded to a mere shadow of what it used to be. It's unacceptable. Uh, it's our duty and responsibility to correct the mistakes and indiscretions of the past lingering in the present, and it's our duty and responsibility to add the attitude and priorities of the worker. Expectations will be heavily raised, and an industrial and production quote is alongside it. It must be made evident that their precious wages are earned, not granted. Working hours will increase as additional hours are added to the workday, as well as this implementation of compulsory unpaid overtime, in order to further assure the employers by heightening our requirements. It simply strengthens the existing industrial structures of Guangdong, expunging all traces of excess and indolence. Um, I think I read this one before. I might not have, but uh, if you want about breaking through, please go ahead. We have more than enough for this. Poverty will begin to rapidly worsen, but you know, it, it, uh, we said our healthcare and education laws at 1962 levels. Yeah, there's no need to uh, seek help. We're doing just as everyone expected us to. But god dang, that corruption. How do we lower it? I wish we could lower it using, like, Japanese approval or something. The Chinese government really hates us, but we don't really care. Product cycle will begin in four days. Nice. Yeah, we're looking very good. We have 9% support. Anywhere but this one, please go ahead. He was thankful. Nice. 
And here we go. Chan turned up the early morning, ready for another day at the office. He was instead gave a flimsy scratchboard box, cardboard box, and a mere five minutes of pack of things before he was no longer welcome on the premises. He began reflecting on the years past. Yes, they were filled with long hours and, we and weekend work and tight deadlines, but at least it was stable and in an office, of course. Uh, <clears throat> uh, that was what helped him endure the reams of shouted abuse and thoroughly mediocre pay. It would always be a lot worse, he told himself. But five years of all that, and it was gone in five, just five minutes. He hadn't expected a grand send-off, but there wasn't enough time to remember everything. While walking out, box in hand, Chen wondered about the future. Yeah, I'm going to do all these, thank you very much. How would he even get a job? His previous employer clearly had no interest. The government certainly wouldn't help, considering they just ended the already limited job search program they once ran. No one would care that he was Zhu Jin. As far as he was concerned, he was on his own. What then could he say to his wife? She was pregnant, too. This was supposed to be their first child. Without a job, he could support. could he support his parents? They weren't getting any younger, and as a firstborn, he needed to look after them, too. How on earth would he escape the funds he needed to keep his family together? All this was far too much for him to bear at the moment. Chan needed some space to breathe, some fresh air. He walked out of the street, and there he saw it. A flood of pseudo men with cardboard boxes just like him, all without jobs. Standing there, hopeless, futureless. It occurred to him that he was almost like all the other Chinese now. Now he knew what it felt like to hit rock bottom. Everything but corruption, and you know what? We could spend this too, but we have more than enough political power. I'm not really concerned. Tracker markets? Um, where do we want to send them to now? Japan? Do we need Japan? Productivity is not bad. Chinese government will not like this, but we don't care. Argentina? Why not? New capital in Belize? Very good. Product release dates? Happy June, everybody. How about the new successful month for all of us? Push it forward. Ooh, boy, that's so high. That's nice. So now, where are we at? 72% and 70%. Incident report. Yin Fiong should have expected this in hindsight. Uh, he probably did. Being present being seen the grisly details of Hu Hin's uh, death, the screams of pain for someone to stop the metal compressor before he would die, the sound of flesh and bone and organs being ground up were play over and over. And the final result, a dead match of what used to be named Li Yu Hin. Who breathed not even three hours ago? Who would have taken out? Who he would have taken out to dinner later today? Breathe in, breathe out. Someone, someone tried to turn off the metal compressor. It was too late, but it was it was too late. Yun Fong heaved out, his vision blurred by tears. Would just stop or work to clean the compressor and clear his body? The mess. There was the smell. Was, his, was it smelly as he cleaned, coming from the blood of the metal? He looked everywhere except the manager himself. How much time? The manager asked. His voice is flat, as it's always been. Although there's somehow more emotion in his voice than when. Then when Yung Fong entered the office, shaking with tears streaming down his face, he should have been angry at the other's apathy. He could have mustered with his strength. The senior plays over and over and over again, striking his heart with horror. An overwhelming cold wraps around his body, inducing a shiver. I I think thirty minutes to an hour. I don't believe anyone kept track of the time. I see. The man gets a paper, quickly scribbling down characters and syllables in Japanese. Yung Fong hears some sputtering, muttering, spat out and exasperated. It's clear from his demeanor that the manager does not care. It's only when he reads over the paper once more that he notices Yung Fong still shaking, still distressed. You can go, he states, waving a hand. Back to your work. Yes. Cattle do not work hard enough. That gives you a crap ton more corruption, which is insane. But it's really good for stability, which I do want. The submission order. Though the market may be an open place for experimentation and plentiful opportunities, the priorities of the benefits of the state and Guangdong must come first. Over the years, the once lucrative and wide markets of the three pros have been diluted and oversaturated by an influx of inexperienced and locally run businesses who directly or indirectly compete with the existing monopolies of established corporations that comprise the foundation of Guangdong are Hitachi being a prime example. The solution is evident. We do what is necessary to force the hands of the smaller businesses to ensure harmony and prosperity on the economic stage. Certain companies who specialize in the markets where Hitachi and other large corporations that hold notable sway or monopolies will either be directly annexed, divided, or willingly or unwillingly signed into contracts of cooperation. The fruits of profit will be distributed throughout the economy, but the weeds acting as hindrance to the harvest must be, of course, removed first. Alright, so where are we at? 72 and a half. There you go. Let's see where we're at next. Ah, research, good. Even though it really does nothing for us, but whatever. Crime where it doesn't belong. A 10% uptick in the robberies? Oh, if you're about this one, please go ahead. I've heard this one before as well. Have your fun approval. Yeah, have your fun. 95%, beautiful. And 85 and a half. Like your conspiracy, huh? Sounds like a personal problem. 
So this one give us 10. So we need just a small one too. Small, small. So we need like cattle. I hate it here. Uh, Kun Hong mutters, and moving quickly to screw on nuts and bolts onto the Nissan machinery. Should have gone somewhere else again. Don't we all, Kun Hong, Kin Hai, whispers back. As I was not straying from the conveyor belt, it could be a lot worse, you know. The other man replies, matter of factly. Uh, it could be a lot better. Yeah, things are only getting worse as we speak. They don't care about us or working. Uh, care about us working. A loud roll drowns out whatever Kun Hong was saying. He turns his head slightly towards Kin Hai. Did you know we're not getting insurance anymore for a split millisecond in his hand? Slow. What? The barest of minimums is too much now. Some policy, huh? Nodding very slightly, unnoticeable to Kun Hong. Kin Hei's eyes return to the conveyor belt. Accidents, too. We're not going to get compensation if that happens. If you or I lose fingers doing this, he points at the conveyor belt, still pushing the machinery towards them, we're screwed. We can afford new clothes as is. How are we going to get food or eat food if it happens? Uh, Kun Hang's voice seeps with poison, spitting out venomous words. Kin Hai wishes he could do something to calm him down. A hand on his shoulder. Hug. It can take a second to peel his eyes away from the conveyor belt, even as Kun Hong recounts countless stories of abuses that he's long been desensitized to, both there, a screw here, periodically he nods, and every so often there's a new horror he wishes he didn't have to hear about that is spat out of Kun Hong's mouth. He holds his breath and lets it out. Kun Hai keeps on twisting the wrench, a bolt here, screw there. He wishes he was as brave as Kun Hong, be able to talk so openly and do his work at the same time. The clacking of those shoes alert them to the manager's presence, and Kun Hong quickly bows his head, silencing himself. A bolt here, screw there, over and over and over and over and over again. But, hey, let's run up them. And the punishments we take. Game officers. officers. Uh, surround Verenum. Venerium. You mount your sir in the tackiest love hotel. He watched it off from the bar across the street, but he always wanted to keep the opulence inside on an unassuming shell, but his partners got too cockney, too cocky, too creative. Look where they were now. Dragged out in chains, bruised and bloody. Next to him was a plain clothes, grim faced camp officer who kept Yamachi watching. It was start here, but soon the other hotels would suffer the same fate. Though no legal harm would ultimately befall Yamachi, his punishment was to watch his most profitable enterprise systematically be ripped apart. Uh, Omnoto was dragged out half naked from the waist down, a few more teeth knocked out from that loud mouth, blood dripping down his drooping chin. Two days appreciate the humiliation. The Kempai Tai pulled him out of a hotel and threw him in the back of a bam, along with seven of his associates, three customers, and twelve women. Ooh. Police taped formed a cordon around the hotel's perimeter. By order of the Guangdong police force, the business was now shut down. See you tomorrow, said Yamachi's minor, who left him to drink his sorrows into submission. He was certainly being watched, but why was he being spared? Yamachi started putting together rumors in the inebriated mind of his. These love hotels have served some purpose to Hitachi. Perhaps Amuro and his family would run and follow them. Perhaps Yamachi still served a purpose to Hitachi. The business was shut down, of course. Uh, but the building was still in his name. Perhaps he'd meet a more pliable Yakuza. He uh, offered a worse deal to stay in the game. Uh, he knew he'd take it. Yamachi buried his face in his folded arms. He had a lot of dreams for Nintendo once, but Hitachi crushed him, and he was too weak to do anything better. Like an insect, he would scurry his company into whatever profitable corner of Guangdong could have seen him. What else could he do? He did the only thing he could do at the moment. He ordered another drink in the Iron Cops. The crates were shipped in the cover of night by Hitachi trucks. With no ceremony and little explanation, their drivers dumped the crates in the loading bays of the police stations and drove off. Only the superintendents were told beforehand, six hours before the delivery, and asked to distribute the contents without delay. Officer Lamb was working the graveyard shift that night, which and was one of the first to receive the presents inside of the crates. Stamped with the Nissan's logo and the state symbol of Machuquo. Coming out of beds of straw were hundreds of new pistols and batons, dozens of submachine guns and rivals for their tactical teams, and a bulletproof vest to outfit every patrol officer twice over and a dozen other pieces of standard kit. The superintendent was present and mildly appreciative of the Nissan's contribution to the Guangdong police force. Prior to the equipment was patchwork. Lamb had a Type 14 from the war, and the officer next to him had a Hanyang made a ruby pistol. Uh, and maintenance had always been a pain. A standardization would alleviate pressures on the budget and make equipment easy to acquire and maintain. And if you cared about logistics only, that was satisfactory. But there was no man in Lamb's station that that, did, that day who didn't understand the message carried by the logo stamped on the crate. When he held the new Nambu 66 in his hands, he recalled all the Hitachi security forces with the exact same gun he seen on patrol. They're now all drawing the equipment from the same arsenal, and Lamb knew that people of Guangdong would notice that similarly. More than one officer walked away with the new guns, asking one question, why don't we just put the stupid Hitachi logo on our uniforms already? Press a profit. No, we can't quite do that one next. Um... Introduce stuff. An invitation for the best. More corruption? Well, introduce a, introduce a curfew. No longer will curfew be a safe way out, conjured up by some spineless parasites within our security forces. From now on, it'll be the norm. The first wall of a sacred fire to purify all our alleyways and boulevards. The serenity of the night is no place for scheming no good loiters, nor for sentimental civilians whining to our officers in a paltry want. And if they wish to prostitute themselves as pass upon our nation, what choice do we have but to sick the flames upon them and lead their smoldering corpses to oblivion? But what else are we do supposed to do? Pretty good. Yeah, how else are we supposed to remove corruption, man? I really don't know. I guess with Happy August, everybody first. And we'll get more approval, anyways. But 
Political power, we don't really need more. I don't mind doing both of these, then. Get some more liquid reserves, I guess. You know? That's really unacceptable. What happens when you get 100%? Oh, here we go. Finally. So that would make it up like 15%. That should be better, but not great. Signing bonuses. It's madness. I won't sign. Uh, uh, this is my business. You can't take it from me. The businessman clenched his muscles in his jaw, his eyes pinned to the negotiator who stood above him. The deal this man offered was an insult, a mere signing bonus that from Hitachi in return for his entire company he had built from the built this firm from the ground up. He would be intimidated, not even by the Yakuza this man had, his, had by his side. The negotiator pushed his men aside and walked towards the businessman, his face between a smile and a sneer. You're not the first man to turn down this deal just a few weeks ago. I met with a Zujin in Hong Kong who turned us down. Cantonese blood must run hot, I suppose. It's a real shame, too. That business didn't do very well after that. Found himself without an owner, and without leadership, it soon fell into government hands regardless. The negotiator slammed his hand on the desk with a brutal force as his palm rose. It revealed a pen, it seemed splattered onto the wood and the papers below. With a flick of his fingers, he rolled the pen towards the businessman, leaving a trail in its wake. You're getting a better deal than that, man. We're offering you a position within the powerful uh, Hitachi Corporation, an executive position. You won't find a better offer here, and you certainly won't find better in the home islands. You have two roads here, and I'm sure you can tell which the other path leads. Take the easy way out. More growth. Beautiful. More centralized? Not, not, not bad. We lost a lot of seats here, here earlier, too, because stupid stuff. By stupid stuff, I mean, like, the, the game just took away our seats, which sucks. Look at that. 6% support. And point. we have one person, maybe. Maybe we have a single person supporting us. Who's Chinese? Look at all that army XP we have. Holy crap. That's a lot of army XP. We're doing quite well. The mobilized television X-ray station. As governments of the Cobra Spirit Sphere attempt to develop the rural areas, they repeatedly encounter endemic diseases ravaging the population. The chief among them being tuberculosis, which only becomes more of a problem as people shift from work working isolated in fields to packed closer in factories. This has increased the demand for diagnostic and treatment tools, a demand that Hitachi tends to fill with a new mobile televised X-ray station. These X-ray machines, unlike older models which were both bulky and delicate, are designed to be lightweight and hardy, able to operate to be operated in underdeveloped areas that lack an established medical infrastructure. Combined with specially made transport trucks, manufactured by Nissan and Manchukuo, they are ready to be shipped out across the sphere, putting Hitachi on the front lines of the fight to improve public health. Beautiful! Deduction is the first step to the treatment. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's percentage. That's new. That's different. I like that. Military austerity, huh? Yeah, not really a big concern of our own. The US bus is not good enough, though. Manchuko truck. Manchu truck. Uh, every dictator knew worth their salt knew how to make trains run on time. Apparently, Argentina, a supposedly liberal democracy with an occasional side job as a military state, did not possess such knowledge. Breakages uh, along the country's freight uh, networks was high and unacceptably high, and it was a throttling Argentina's investment potential. You never knew how long shipment was going to take, even if the rail trip was only supposed to take a few hours. Uh, Hitachi and Nissan, though, they knew how to make trains run on time. And mature, they've proven it. And now they're over in Argentina to tackle the gargantuan task of bringing the modern railway to a country that seemed to make a fetish out of antiquated infrastructure. The vehicle was Hitachi Rail, a specially created a subsidiary company. Hitachi Rail shipped engines from Guangdong and personnel from Manchuria, as well as masses of manual labors to change the country's rail gauge from the previous system based around the British Indian model. Hitachi's help didn't come cheap, of course, so the dudes seemed intent on swindling the government at every opportunity, adding triple-digit markups on engines and uh, signal infrastructure, but even as Argentina poured money into Hitachi's open mouth, the rail network slowly ground forwards into the modern age. And that really was all that mattered. And as we've got the green tea here, matcha green tea, to keep us nice and satisfied. A bit brighter, huh? Not bad, but this is unacceptably high. My god, 76% dropped down to 56, which is nice, but my good lord. A step too far. They all knew what was going to be going home was a risk. Lin, Ren, and Pak had just found their shifts had expected to last it longer than the night, which made going home a death wish. But Pak had just had to get back and check on his daughter. She'd been sick for days, and she couldn't, couldn't just leave her alone with her mother. So the men snuck out. Ren could feel his body shaking as they all tiptoed through the empty streets, careful to keep themselves out of light. Lin led them at the front, right in the middle, and Pac trailed behind in the back. Their hearts were all being faster than they ever had before. Suddenly, a searchlight swung right in front of them, illuminating Lin where he stood. His face paled as a whistle screeched at them from afar. Run, Pac bellowed, and they scattered in opposite directions. 
The pitter-patter of footsteps quickly followed them, and as if a man could be heard screaming in them in Japanese. Ren kept running, even as he heard gunshots from afar. A sharp pain rippled through his leg. He collapsed, feeling blood begin to trickle out of his calf. He has been shot. A heavy-set man in a Hitachi uniform hoisted him over his shoulder, throwing Ren into the van. His vision was blurred, but as, as he awaited his fate, he could not he could make out the silhouette of Pack. He was lying there motionless, an expression of pure horror fixed on upon, fixed upon his face. A few days later, three bloody bodies had been dumped in the neighboring neighborhood next to the factory. Next to them was a sign written in Japanese, Chinese, and Cantonese, reminding citizens not to be caught out at night past curfew. Everyone who walked past it silently acknowledged the truth behind their execution. They were not killed because they were past curfew. They were killed because they were Chinese and nobody else could help them out. The price of profit. Our exalted chief executive has presided over numerous sublime achievements in stark and utter contrast to the inertia and ineffectual efforts of our imbecilic and inept predecessors. A radiant president that is to be followed by generations to come, undoubtedly. The establishment of Hitachi supremacy upon Guangdong's markets and economy is one of the greatest achievements realized through the, under the guidance of the chief executive through his position in the legislative council, of which he is rightfully deserving. Yet the dream has not been completely fulfilled. The ripe and plump fruits of the profit dangling from the branches of dominance have yet to be merely entirely har harvested. Therefore, we must continue to utilize the powers of the Legislative Council to ensure that our endeavors encounter no obstacles or resistance. Under our illustrious administration, the Council is to remain a tool, another opportunity for growth and our ability to reach out our economic comparative. One where our presence and support are to be guaranteed by our loyal and steadfast corporate sponsors. Our path to prosperity is fixed. Our journey is aided by the powers imbued within the Legislative Council and the backing of our benefactors. None shall oppose our ascension. Beautiful. Increases Japan's approval again, huh? Nice. Might as well just keep burning it. Why not? Oh, we have just so little. We can't even do this one. So little approval. Wow. That happens. Monthly government support. Republic of China. Cap. Things happen, man. Things happen. You never know. More growth? What's not to love? Who gives a crap about debt when you have so much growth? Whilst our auxiliary police units prowl the streets in search for scum to throw into the dark pits, locked away from the touch of the sunlight until they wither and die in cold, we are far from our desired gold and settling rustless crowds. Therefore, it's in our best interest to invite experts in the realm of crushing descent. While issuing formal requests and invitations uh, to Nissan representatives and agents of Machuco, offering the positions of authority over policing and state security, we welcome the very best in our ranks. May our ties to the company produce fruitful responses, and may the subduing of insurgent forces be found among them. Yes. Uh, the economy. Less than 4.4 billion in national debt, a lot well stolen. Yoshiko went over to the draft again. Grammar was effective, vocabulary descriptive, arguments passable. Good enough for Hitachi, she thought to herself. <clears throat> It was insulting enough to have her write their pop pieces. No need for another round of polishing. In truth, Yoshiko was horrified by Hitachi's newest proposal, the Economic Partnership Ordinance, the bill for which she was supposed to be singing praises. It was a direct attack on smaller firms in Guangdong, forcing them to join with larger firms. It was certainly no coincidence that Hitachi would likely be most aggressive with pursuing the newest legislation. Perhaps in the Kantan Fujin Koran wasn't safe. Previously, the government had protected it from any sort of forced buyout, but clearly Hitachi wasn't interested in following them through on that. Perhaps he'd be soon be working for them. Maybe she could go back to Japan. Yoshiko looked towards her office window, hanging on that idea. It almost felt reasonable, but no, she couldn't. Even if the conditions were better, what was left for her there? She had built a life in Guangdong, her life, even if Hitachi was about to steal it. The great machine. Soon Guangdong shall work like clockwork, with Komai as clockmaker extraordinaire. The only friendship we need. Nissan shall provide men with expertise to lubricate Guangdong's industry as never before. Friend from high places. We shall open the financial floodgates, and Machuko's money shall inundate Guangdong. Ooh. Well, we'll probably win this one next. Bloodstreak sidewalks. Firearms are the ultimate instrument. The spark to ignite Guangdong's fiery nerva, nirvana. And firearms are campfire warehouses, and the Manchukuo steelworks will provide, assembled and gifted to us with the utmost care and camaraderie. Let our loyal officers, with the might of our firearm in hand, and with righteous fury in their hearts, set ablaze our defiled soil and expel the treacherous, cowering vermin from whatever filth they bury themselves in. The next time our chief executive sets his watchful gaze upon the jewel of the south, it shall have been baptized by blood, cleanse of the stench of rot forevermore. Power of pu uh, publicity. Hitachi's company board of directors were in the midst of debating the recent economic partnership and reconciliation ordinance. The majority believed that the ordinance would require some modification in order to secure enough votes to pass. Some members of the board believed such amendments were unnecessary and would either compromise the ordinance's effectiveness or jeopardize the ordinance's chance of passing. Aside from those who wished to leave the ordinance as it was, there largely formed two groups within the debate. 
The first opinion believed that the ordinance simply did not give Hitachi enough control over the aspects of the economy. They proposed that the ordinance needed to be giving Hitachi more oversight over subsidiary and contractor factories and economic resources. It would likely be reviewed or viewed as a blatant power grab, but the potential benefits of such control could prove worthwhile beyond that. The second opinion believed the ordinance would stifle matter smaller companies too harshly in this current state. They believed it was necessary to throw those companies a bone and ensure that the ordinance would grant them sufficient work as contractors to Hitachi. Eventually, the debate reached an impasse, and the board referred to Kamai to make a final decision. It should not be amended. Creator controls required for objectives. Allows Hitachi to press claims to expropriate useful property. Guarantees smaller companies more contract work. Favors the Zujin business owners of Guangdong. Creator control. Even more growth, less, uh, less losing your support. Increase it receipts by one. How is the economy doing? We're, how centralized are I mean, are we? Oh, two doors ahead. Kamai pondered the Economic Partnership and Reconciliation Ordinance. It was still wasn't guaranteed to pass the Legislative Council. Kamai assumed that he had to fall back on his usual methods of securing support, directly appealing to and threatening the competition. In this case, that meant Ibuka and Masashita. Ibuka was a fiercely independent in his position. Getting any support from him would be a boon of our efforts to pass the ordinance. Getting a compromise on his own pride would be a hassle, but even beyond simple incentives, there was no way to convince Ibuka to concede. Matsushita would be more difficult to threaten considering his father's connections in the home islands. While Kamai would have less leverage over him, Matsushita would likely also be easier to convince than Ibuka. Simply butter him up, give his company more favorable tax treatments, and likely he'd fold. A simple question remains, who should Kamai approach? Neither. We don't need him. 60% growth is not enough. Any more approval? Oh, give me this stuff. We have literally zero support. Fast we get taken over by the Republic of China. They already beat up, as you can see, uh, Yunnan. So. And the balance was written. Yes, that sounds agreeable. A song finally replied, and come on, can it show his jaw practically hit the desk? So if you're going to this one, please go ahead. I think I heard this one before. Backseat driving. Well, if you don't need this, please go ahead. That's fine. We can lower this too. The holdout. Wong had tried to handle the situation as delicately as po possibly could. A few days ago, a team of salespeople approached him with a proposal they said he can turn down. No, they tried to seduce him with all the petty, pretty words, regaling him with grand tales of how Hitachi would facilitate the smooth operation of a small business. It was a horrible deal. For a one, the contract would force him to only serve Hitachi, no one else. And that wasn't bad enough. The service fee as a salesman had told him was a very substantial sum. Besides, he wasn't in the electronics business. What could Hitachi do to help his little corner shop anyway? This was practically extortion, and it was done in broad daylight too. There was one more pressing concern, the most important one. Hidden in the third annex of the contract was a clause giving Hitachi the right to intervene in the business for practically any reason. The salesman tried to convince him, in unconvincing Cantonese, that it was a mere safeguard, only used against unsavory individuals that might take advantage of Hitachi's trust and support. Wong knew it was complete total BS. It wasn't just a shakedown now, it was a pure power grab, and everyone knew it. So he did the most logical thing, which was to refuse to sign the contract, politely tell him off for lying, and send him back to the headquarters. Evidently, that hadn't stopped them. The same salespeople were returning, but this time they weren't alone. They were guarded to their left and right by st tall, stocky men who acted as security. Wong wondered they were right after all. This really was a deal he couldn't refuse. So, Mr. Wong, if you could just sign here, please. Nice. 19%. That's decent. Hey, 4 billion. Nice. Very nice. The Great Machine. One, two, three, go. Uh, did I read this one? I thought I read this one. Uh, well, Guangdong is a nation with immense capability, a workforce eager and diligent, our economy fruitful and prosperous. Guangdong's structure, economic apparatus, is a system suited for welfare and success, of guided with wisdom and prudence, able to produce remarkable benefits and profits. Unfortunately, she has not been navigated with efficiency and care towards glory and economic triumph, but instead led straight towards a perennial and perpetual cycle of decay and negligence. With her nine chief executive grasped the reins of power with his skillful hands. Guangdong's potential was shepherded towards her intended destiny. As of present, the ceaseless journey towards prosperity continues, presided over by our administration. It seems that the engine is re to reach its full throttle. Any assistance would be of great benefit to our efforts. It seems that our charitable benefactor of Nissan is willing to offer that st their support. A partnership would lead Guangdong into a greater area of stability, one that ensures a glorious and profitable future by any means necessary. 
The doors burst apart, opening in the arena splinters. Uh, a flash grenade followed, exploding into bursts of blinding light. The Guangdong police force moved in, submachine guns drawn, and bent the ready fingers on the trigger. Shots for order fought screams of panic, and the rattling of gunfire erupted in one of the apartment buildings. For Lamb, it was almost like the 50s again. Things were different, however. All he felt during the operation was an animal rage that drove him blind against his conscience. One that animated his shoulders as he brushed aside a suspect and swung the stock of his gun amid a face. They dragged out men from their hiding places, from cupboards and wardrobes, they, from trap doors and balconies. A few were unconscious when they were cuffed, but bruised black and purple swelling from their youthful faces. Not pretty, but it gets the job done. Lamb kept telling himself that. When they sat down for a debriefing, the Manchurian officer congratulated them on the brutality. Brain dogs, he called them, crying because of the first taste of blood. Lamb found it hard to contradict. This would be an example going forward. A lone arm raised itself in question. What happened to policing, the escalation, and rules of engagement? The answer was coached with a smile. The people respect the power of fear. I'm not sure which way I want to go with this, but blood streaked sidewalks. We'll do this one next too. Purging the innards. You get more stability, which I do like, without a trace. You get corruption no matter what. I kind of like this one. Necessary sacrifices. Swallowed by the night. Here's the seats for us. Here's the Japan's approval. Which I don't really care about Japan's approval too much. Swallowed by the night. Necessary sacrifices. What about necessary sacrifices? We need more political power. I can't do anything here either, so. Kinda stuck. Do we have 52 seats? What's not the love? Um, so, what bunch we need? Slicing through red tape. If you're under this one, please go ahead. Red tape. Ah, well, can't see it now, anyways. Hmm. Decrease admin cost. It greatly decreases maximum investment admin efficiency. Model worth replicating. Introduce a new bill. More, way more growth. In your name only. Contracts and under active the active ordinance granting following effects. More stability. And offering to our patrons. Removes the last environmental regulations that are affecting Guangdong's growth. It does increase. National debt. Uh, now, that's, now that's different. National debt would decrease by 1.75 billion. That's interesting. Versus the friends from high places. Let's get this one going on anyways. A flow of wealth. More stability there. A little more corruption though. Growth increase. More increase our liquid reserves. A gift to the powers that be. Nisa will pay for 15% of our social and military costs. Stack the deck. A staff of Nissan's best. Warm breath down our neck. With Manchurian money in hand and the usual honeyed words in our ears, Guangdong will surely climb ever higher. More than a guess, under Nissan and Manchukuo's guiding hand, Guangdong sees life as a vicious future. Hmm. So overall, you can get this way... Industrial expertise does go up, which is nice. Uh, growth is 0.15. So potentially 0 0.4. Uh, 0 0.15. So 0 0.14. If you do this one, is 0.65. 0.65, that's all you get. Over here, if you go 1, 2, 3, 4. But this way, you get what? Look at reserves, you get uh, 0.2 plus, 0.2 is 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.55, 0 0.7. Ooh, ooh, I wanna maximize the growth. So, oh, I think it's more. We'll probably go French from high places then. One of the fundamental pillars of Guangdong's economy would be its lucrative yet erratic and volatile stock exchange, an institution that is essential for the transformation and establishment of Guangdong's economy, where fortunes are gained and lost. It would have allowed the Nissan Corporation to provide us with optimal assistance. We must welcome them into our various economic institutions, one of which is a stock exchange along with several other financial sectors. Every nation has become a glorious paradigm of economic success, an example that is to be followed by countless future generations and states. We must greet our benefactors into our affairs with open arms and receive them with grace. There are no other options. A clean speech. Although, uh, the Legislative Council building was in session, its doors were locked, and although the chatter of the public and journalists ran thick in the air outside, all was silent within the halls of power. The corridors were empty, the marble floors didn't even echo the crack of heels striking the ground. Within the chamber, Chief Executive Kumai stood before the members of the Assembly, aloof and silently basking in the glory of his newly crowned authority. It's like a grin cursed all those in the chamber members from benches that curled around the lofty hall that had their fearful eyes glued to him, their gaze burning messages of dread, dismay, and even most importantly, submission to his will. Leaning over the podium, Kamai cleared his throat to announce his speech, cutting through the silence like a blade over tender flesh. 
gentlemen and compatriots, we arrive at this moment in our long history at a crossroads. Our livelihoods and discipline are under threat, besieged by economic woe and misfortune. We are a nation of hard-working peoples, inheriting uh, an ancestral tradition of industrious and entrepreneurial customs. Let us not be rooted, uprooted from the success and tossed aside because we face adversity now. The members looked at him, the whites in their eyes color in the room with fear and punished a confusion. Why did the chief executive, Japanese as they come, include himself in describing the Cantonese people? The silence in the chamber was chilling, unclear if it was born from genuine fear or timid confusion. The chief executive continued to speak from his managerial throne, his words thundering like the boom of war drums from the regal platform. Once the dictate had ended, the poison grin had returned and the awesome applause from the bench just soon followed after. What other choice did they have, though? None. 20% growth? That's a decent amount. It's not enough, but... A decent amount. Oh, look at this. We are max, almost maxed out for centralization. Decentralization versus centralization. More output. Beautiful. Keep making those roads. Product cycle. So it's 1968. We're getting closer and closer to uh, what's going to really be fun here. So in this campaign, oh, the Spears here. That's cool. Oh, economic check. Do we need what? 40.05 billion. Well, I hope we've reached that. If we haven't, then we failed. I love how great Germany is. God, I love big Germany. WRRF. Our Euro military districts is still alive somehow. Huh. Boris the third is gone. Oh, wait. Why is the Euro military... District here, and they got down there. Cold War interface is still cool to, to have down there. Ah, crack down on petty corruption. No, we'll try our best. Eight percent growth, huh? Three point five six nine, huh? Not good enough. A good month, though. Then was tired. It'd been a long day for for. Feet burned with each step down the sidewalk. Twelve hours staying on them had left them feeling abused beyond belief. But she was content. Her boss had given her a small bonus for staying late at, the, late at the butcher shop in the form of an unsold pork shoulder. Now she didn't have to worry about buying another meal this week. Lynn could put her earrings toward the family savings, perhaps even purchase a gift for her children. With her all slung under one arm, she picked off bit, raw, mitts, raw bits of meat out from under her fingernails. The small repetitive action helped take her mind off the splitting headache she had. She was alone in the dark street. The alley she passed yawned like mouths waiting to swallow her up. She longed for home. Twice she heard a scrape of a foot that wasn't in the hers in the deserted street. She looked around, but didn't dare stop. She made it home safe many nights before, and she told herself that tonight would be no different. But good, things were different, and perhaps she'd be a, better put a stop to these late nights for her sake and for her children's. A watch precaution. Stack the deck. Point two. Uh, but more corruption. Point two. All right. Our partners in Nissan bring with them necessary devices of development from the North, leaving a golden trail of wealth behind them as a result of their investments and attention. In order for us to effectively reap the benefits of Nissan's involvement, we must not shut off the gates of our economy. As the bountiful treasures of the Northeast trickle down to the Pearl River, are we to disrupt its entrance with an immovable dam? No, it would be preposterous. We must keep our gates open and our rivers unblocked as the profits brought on by Nissan will water our verdant meadows and ripen the fruits and products of industrialization and economic prosperity. But bloody sidewalks. Lynn carried on through the city, ruminating on what she was going to cook tonight and what small gifts she could get from the market for her children. She only faintly noticed that she was beginning to walk through some of the poorer sections of the city, poorer than even she or her family were, in fact. Radical. Not that it mattered. All that mattered to Lynn was providing for her family, not falling into the depths that those poor souls had fallen to. As Lynn fought for past her headache, her reverie was interrupted by a brutesque, a brusque cough. She shook herself and found an officer remaining a barricade in front of her. The officer looked at her as if she was dirt beneath her boot in badly accented Cantonese. By order of the Guangdong police, this area is closed off to public access. Please take another out. Then wondered why exactly they shut the road off. She looked a bit behind the officer and saw a police van flanked by five or so officers. In its high beam headlights, she saw four men standing against a wall, handcuffed and frightened into stillness. Further off, she saw the outline of a fifth man under a sheet. But before she could carry on looking, one of the officers, beholding the rifle on the left, looked up to her with limited eyes. Then shut her. Called out into the officer who had stopped her and turned around, taking a different route home. She tried and failed to distract herself from what she had seen. Such scenes played out any time throughout Hitachi's Guangdong. Some much needed improvements. Guangdong's police, or the security services as Kamai Kinichiro would call them, were supposed to be Guangdong's bulwark, a shield that would protect the Republic from the agitators and revolutionaries who would otherwise destroy it. In practice, that wasn't the case. Whether by design or neglect, Guangdong security services did not have the funding to defend the state properly, and to send continued fester beneath the surface. This would not do, Kamai thought. That is why the public's ability and security ordinance have been introduced to begin with. It already said earlier that the police codes would be loosened, which would now allow them to respond to these radicals with equal punitive force, naturally. This would also come with increased funding, itself supported by the generous assistance of the Kenpai Tainisa, but even that wouldn't be enough. More would be needed, since Okamai examined three proposed amendments. 
One option was to expand the security budget. Well, simple, this would be an effective way to ensure that the security services would have the ability to cover more areas, run more patrols, and execute their operations to a higher standard. However, it would also be the most expensive option. Alternatively, the funding could be redirected towards Republic jails instead. Guangdong's prison would burst into the brim, and being able to place more criminals in these jails would be a boon for the stability of the Republic. Finally, there was the option to expand the public's anti crime campaigns. If Guangdong's population never thought of dissenting, just waited for rebelling against the government, well, that would save the police significant time and energy that could be spent elsewhere. Come on, give these three options some thought. So, expand the security budget. Increase the budget granted for security forces, which will make them more efficient. The jails need money, and the criminals. Expands the amount of money given to individual prisons to ensure that they can effectively keep dissenters incarcerated. And the anti crime campaigns will be most effective. Expands messaging to reduce crime in Guangdong society. Uh, let's go with that one. Appreciate you, why not? Uh, we also have that one too. Uh, here are all the awards we have here, which is very nice. Uh, we have 67 votes, which honestly is pretty good. We go from oppressive police to totalitarian police, which is pretty. That's good for us. We're more Caso, but you know, whatever. We get more political power, I guess. That's a good thing. Uh, I'm not sure if we really need more political power now, but you know, whatever. Um, approval. Well, we don't need that much approval from everybody here, I guess, you know. Friend from high places, though, like we read earlier. Uh, where are we at? Uh, if you don't need this one again, please go right ahead. And we'll uh, stack the deck. Point one, point two. More stability, yes please. Our partners in Nissan bring with them necessary devices of development from the north, leaving a golden trail of wealth behind them, a result of their investments and attention. In order for us to effectively reap the benefits of Nissan's involvement, we must not shut off the gates for our economy. As the bountiful treasures of the northeast trickle down the Pearl River, we are to disrupt... Are we to disrupt its entrance with a movable dam? No, for it would be preposterous. We must keep our gates open and the rivers unblocked as the profits brought by on by Nissan will water our verdant meadows and ripen the fruits and products of industrialization and economic prosperity. If you're wondering about geniality, please go ahead. Uh, actually, how much approval do we have? We have more than enough. That's okay. If you're wondering about uh, uh, 1952 Part 3, please go ahead too. Um, I think I read this one before, so get that off your chest. Um, if you want to see this one, please go ahead too. It doesn't really matter since, uh, well, they're already at zero, so, well, we'll scare them. Uh, secure beneath our watchful eyes, we believe that the slogan's a good reminder of Guangdong's continued stability and strength amidst the many threats this Republic faces. Thank you for your time. With that, the middle-aged Zhu Jin. Bureaucrat bowed, wrapping up his presentation. Uh, an awkward silence lingered. The Hitachi PR man brought all the way from a true quote for this very discussion, and obviously Japanese wasn't looking up from his desk. I think Skull grew from a previously stony face expression. When Hitachi man looked up to speak again, his voice was soft yet threatening. Have we not made ourselves clear enough to you? This campaign isn't meant to be sweet and wonderful. Your slogan might be as well be a bedtime story. Scrap it. A scoff, the beer crap gulped. The Dutch man continue, we want them to feel fear, terror, dread, before they even think about disobedience. We want them to imagine every single painful detail of the consequences. Only then will they comply. Please try again. Got flat footed. The bureaucrat stammered out his response. Sorry, sir, we have more suggestions. How about we are always watching or uh, don't do it? Or maybe. A document interrupted in mid speech. No, no, no. You're getting completely wrong, useless ticks. I'll do it myself. He strode over to the whiteboard, taking large steps, and grabbed a marker pen for the table. With broad sweeping strokes, he spelled out four large red words that told them everything they needed to know. You will regret this. Everything is not real. Oh, look at this. Staring intensely at the ground to avoid undue attention, Lee Wai walked back from school, desperately trying to convince herself that everything was still normal. It absolutely was not, not at all. All the familiar police uniforms were replaced by the same sandy khaki military outfits. The certain faces on patrol were gone, and the place was absolutely emotionless surveys that swept through almost every street in the city. Even their boots were different, too. The camp ties made a loud crunch every time they hit the ground. They were like drones, regular and precise, executing their duties with metronomic brutality. She knew all too well not to look at the officers in the eye, since she had seen firsthand what happened to the people who did. The raw, visceral fear, and the older woman's eyes as she was picked out for questioning, the way her, the muscles in her face tensed, the way her body froze up was unforgettable. Lee Wai thought... Uh, but the older woman looked a bit like Ama. The memory sent up chills over her spine. A few police stood there by too, making, watching meekly from by the side, going along with the show, but that was just an aber aberration. Like many others, if you just squinted a bit, if you were just less attentive than you normally were, you could almost pretend like everything was fine again. The meter shrieking from the nearby police station, from one of those overly melodramatic radio dramas, of course. As she reached home, Lee Wai realized her heart was beating extremely quickly. She wasn't sure if it was out of panic or because she had just stepped, walked the distance in less than half the time she normally did. She tried muttering a familiar mantra she went into her home and wanted to soothe her through a truth she could not accept. Everything is fine. Everything is fine. Everything is... Hmm. No, we had some liquid reserves, huh? Nice. Less than four billion in debt. We're doing the right job. We've got some comments to go through, too, but stack the deck. Now that I think I read this one earlier, too, but now that we've trimmed the excess fat from the economy of Guangdong, we have no use for leftovers, however. Nissan. Uh, maybe interested in making them useful, and we've much to gain by selling liquidated produce and industry to divisions of Nissan. From quick fortune to long-term in favor of our patrons. Guangdong is a home of Asian innovation, and will continue to carry on the legacy of our forefathers and allies at Nissan. Some comments include, after Kamai, can you do a TNO sub called Sony Plus? Maybe, I don't know, we'll see. 
Uh, so far, the campaigns for Guangdong interest has gone down, but, you know, maybe eventually. Someone says, Guangdong has been secured and business is booming. I can't buy will get rid of some undesirables. Someone else says, Kaman's vision of Guangdong continues to progress. Ignoring the so-called parasites who criticize his policies. Also, don't forget, anger the populace too much, or else Kaman will get assassinated in the riots. Oh. I didn't know that. That's cool. Well, not for Kamai, but, you know, whatever. Lieutenant Sim Wei hung Drago to his feet to work, his head hanging low and his eyelids drooping lower. He was exhausted, the company kept demanding higher and faster results from brokers like him. He wrapped his finger around the icy door handle, swinging open the door and shuffling through the staff doorway, not paying much attention to anything other than his old cold sniffle and aching bones. After hanging up his coat and sending his report, Hung wiped his glasses as he waddled to the trading floor. The bright lights dazed numb pupils, his eyes switched off a dry and itchy patch. Itchy, scratchy itch. There was something different about today, however. His attention slowly lifted from the singing sting in his sinuses as he pieced together the environment around him. A new life that sees a stock exchange building is the mutter and chatter of the men at hard at work, bounced off the glassy marble floors. The yellow chandelier lights, aristocratic in some ways, glistened above, hung slowly noticed. New staff and formal attire, empty cardboard boxes, printed with a Hitachi logo on the trading desks, populated in the workstations with new fancy equipment and communications tools that Hung had never seen before. His eyes widened, seized by the realization he wasn't quite sure what the chief executive meant by economic revolution. When he heard it on the radio, but this must have been it. All senses were arrested by the squeaking of expensive shoes on the marble trading floor, and by the chatter he tried to make out Japanese words from. Hung kept his head down and headed his expression. There was no use in showing his mind race in his heart thunder, but for if there was anything he was certain about, there was no space for hesitation in Komai's Guangdong. Do not ask questions. Do not. Do we get at least 40 points? Yes, we did. There we go. Get back to work. Can we burn? Yes, we can burn just a little bit. Oh, do we have another one here? No, that sucks. Eh, well, let's see how far we can get, because it's going to auto-complete anyway, so we'll be fine, even if we just let it expire. I don't think we'll get anything, but, you know, you never know. But like I said, I would like to continue reducing corruption if possible. That would probably be for the best. Uh, doesn't look like we're going to get anything else here. 96%, well, could be better, but whatever. Hey, better power efficiency? Sign us up. Sign us up. Three hundred plus point seven, not bad. Stack the deck. Do what you love. Can I help you with anything else today, sir? Hung pause. No, the pleasure's all mine. Have a good day, sir. Hung's a facsimile smile fa faded from his face as he placed the phone back into the receiver. After the Hitachi takeover, he felt like every client of the stock exchange was the same. Gruff Japanese men, speaking a few words as possible, purchasing massive shares of Guangdong's businesses with amounts of money inconceivable to him. The fact that every order was placed by mentor and executives of Nissan's subsidiaries did not escape his notice, nor did the ever-increasing number of Hitachi and Nissan representatives taking the place of retired employees. Hung quickly learned to spot, uh, how to spot those who were about to replace. Those with complaints never lasted more than a day, and those with uh, eye bags rarely made it farther than a week. Made it farther than a week. Any last enthusiasm was typically coupled with a polite tap on the shoulder and a short visit to the manager's office. Maintaining an acceptable appearance became Hung's first and most taxing priority. Cheap makeup uh, hid his worn down features and he practiced a perfect habit to help you smile in his mirror with each morning before work. He knew it would be enough. Sooner or later, the company was going to sack him and he could only hope that his savings lasted long enough to find another job in the rapidly shrinking market. The harsh ringing of the phone jolted Hung out of his trance. He sat straight up, uh, aware that the delay would attract attention. Contorting his, contorting his face back into a pristine smile, he brought the receiver to his lips. This is the Koshi Stock Exchange. How can I assist you? Uh, staff of the Nissan's best. As we continue upon the endeavor and conclusion of Nissan Corporation to our economic ap apparatus and affairs, it must account for all the fruits that may bring to our nation and soon be a thriving economy. An asset possessed by Nissan, we must not neglect or dismiss, is a significant amount of talent present, present within our corporation. We must employ and make the use of the skilled directors and executives of Nissan at our disposal. Appoint them to effective positions in our administration and corporate structure, sure, soon. Our bureaucracies are bound to be filled with exceptionally talented and experienced individuals, destined to lead Guangdong to triumph and prosperity. A nation will be unparalleled in success except for the powerhouse of Manchukuo itself. Challengers. Oh, crap. You try to reduce corruption, and you really can't get anywhere with it. Sure, we'll get more liquid reserves, why not? That's <sighs> 6%. percent that is painful, man. Not bad, though. Not bad. Hey, more data storage? Why not? We love data storage here, right? Right. Absolutely. Alright, come, come on. Like, bruh. 
Give me more anti-corruption stuff. Oh, not good. If you know this one, please go ahead too. And on it went, rolling and rolling, till the world was bleak and there was no escape. Stack the deck. New prospects. The downdraft from the helicopter rippled the rough fabric of Leung's suit and kicked up dust in his face. He clasped his hands over his belt, squeezing tight to work, uh, tight to work out his nerves. A split second after the chopper touched down, the Nissan survey team poured out. Clipboards and notebooks in hand, they approached Leung, who had bowed respectfully, and offered his hand to each one of the team. Up your fly was pleasant, Leung said as he shook his hands. The man from Nissan made some non-committal noises. Leung swallowed and waved towards the ramp leading to the quarry floor. If you follow me, I'll show you to the site. After they descended the walls of the quarry, a group of Chinese laborers stood aside and regarded the bes uh, besieged troop anxiously. Leung sympathized. Last month he'd been in their shoes, uncertain whether he would still have a job. Well, he did, but many of the many past pay uh, faced paycuts or unemployment with Nissan to officially took over. Leung couldn't look him in the eye. Under Nissan, the only thing a Chinese could do, a Chinese man could do, was work out for his own survival. Not an ideal situation, but warm breath down her neck. Our chief executive. As a man who embodies enlightened and prudent thinking, adaptable and knowledgeable. It's an act of several astute initiatives that have all benefited Guangdong exceptionally. The certainty of the pearls being restored gradually with the passing of every decree and the announcement of every measure. A key decision made by our chief executive is that it's proven to be extraordinarily fruitful and rewarding. A demonstration of his wisdom, which would be the continued partnership with our patron, the Nissan Corporation, the title they have rightfully earned. Nissan, as applies with bountiful support and assistance, in both the forms of physical assets and mental tenants and advice, and taking Hitachi Nissan in the inseparable web of financial involvement and mutual benefit. The other present presence uh, on the present presence and engagement that Nissan possesses are apparent in all facets of Guangdong's economic apparatus, further propelling us towards a future of continued health, prosperity, and success. If Guangdong and Tachi are to join and challenge the greatest economies currently present upon this earth, it would be under the benevolent and crucial auspices of Nissan, and under the efficient system of Manchukuo. Yeah. Yeah, we're great. We get any more favors, maybe. Kinda of doubt it, but it's already May. Talking to a brick wall, there you go again. What's good for Japan? Ooh. Uh, decrease the proof. Oh, we can decrease it by a little bit. Like parrots. Well, the real concern at the moment is a reduction of waste. The current model is being altered to reflect the tried and tested venture model, so we can boost productivity and cut down cost of nothing. It's especially important for us to. Yoshiko pause recording, only resisting the urge to slam her head onto the, the desk by hair. What was the fourth new administrator? <clears throat> That Nissan brought over from Manchuria, who she had interviewed that day, and each was more grating to listen to than the last. They weren't actively annoying, per se, it was quite the opposite. Each of these men were saying the exact same thing. Efficiency, streamlining, cutting costs, a sorry state of things, bold new ideas from Manchuria. Expertise, all devised by the new chief executive. Yoshiko felt like she was going mad if someone had cloned the perfect bland, uninspiring bureaucrat and inserted him everywhere. Literally shaking her head, she got up from her desk and began to make her way to bed. The fourth great man in a suit could wait until the morning, who knows? Maybe tomorrow would hold something more exciting to do, somewhere out there. Uh, uh, of another high office building to go to, something else. But deep down she knew it would just be more of the same. Now, House of Terror. A killer's muscle memory. Ooh. The utility of despair. Keep it a secret. I do utility of despair. But without a trace is cool, but I want to do this one. Purging the innards. We're a nation of diligent citizens. Uh, a constant toil to preserve a hard-working way of life from corrupting and subverting forces, cre creeping in filthy back streets and swallowing shadows. Such forces. Wherever they may be found are nothing but the craft of traitors. Using an en en but using an enemy is far more effective than stomping one out. From be they from the highest echelons of society or from the dirtiest of those living on the streets, their crimes will not go unpunished. Their trials will rally public hatred against the enemies of our regime, whether they know it or not, and work in our favor to manage and divide public opinion. Soon enough, we'll be able to be we will be dividing the goats from the sheep. Why not? That represents a little better, but still not great. Ah, the product cycle. What do we have? The H7830 text visualization interface, real time input, hundreds of transistors per chip. Ah, sure, why not? And we got two. And that one, and that one, and that one, and that one, and that one. It already pissed them off so much, it doesn't really matter, right? But happy New June, everybody! New June! <sighs> Alright, ooh. Hmm. Release market? Eh, yeah, we can go into this one too. More pro production units? Nice. Oh, we'll go with more civilian stuff. Warm breath down her neck and give me more growth, which is nice. Get more seats, even though it's going to be stolen away from us later. We've already 52, which is 
really good, but you know, whatever. Um, anything else here? Ah, barely. If you want to this one, please go ahead too. And now, a word from our sponsor. That's a normal day in Guangdong. The Japanese cheered and howled as they made and lost fortunes, and the workers jumped from the sweatshops to be released from hell. Only to find that their demons had installed suicide prevention nets to Tanaka. <clears throat> that was a normal day in Koshu. It looked like it would be a normal day in the legislative council when you walked into the building, entering the room. <clears throat> uh, Tanaka noticed something was off. About an eighth of the council was not present. Initially, it seemed that they were merely late, but when he walked to a seat, he noticed that their nameplates had been removed from their desks. They've been replaced, said Tanaka. Usually the members of the Legislative Council had enough connections to various corporations and groups that only the new time members, or only time new members of the council were appointed was when the former members retired. Perhaps they were truly retiring? Tanaka's optimism was dashed when the name plates of the new members were put on their desks. Every new name was connected to the Nissan, managers, investors, and engineers, and even the CEO of the Guangdong branch. Tanaka sat down, his eyes cautiously looking for the new members of the council. His eyes darted at the entrance when he heard the voices of his peers stepful. In walked Komai, the chief executive with the briefcase. Komai made his way to his desk, opened his case, and pulled out a stack of papers, clearing his throat. Komai began his introduction to the council. Before we dis begin discussing our reports and proposals, I'd like to say a few words, he said. First, I'd like to welcome our newest members of the Legislative Council, all the prominent members of the Nissan. Komai started clapping, with many members reluctantly clapping with him. Second, I'd like to personally thank the Nissan Corporation for its contributions to the growth and prosperity of our economy. Without Nissan, Guangdong would be unproductive. Now, if you turn to your pages, the papers to page 6. Meet the new boss. Where's the old boss? Uh, swallow by the night. Uh, increases our seats by one. Necessary sacrifices. I kind of like that one. You will be forgotten. Solitude. This is police control, which you don't necessarily want. Hmm. Hmm. Necessary sacrifices? As a result of the hard work of law enforcement uh, across this great nation, the sick and dissident traders prowling the shadows have been scrapped from the darkness of city streets and thrown into cold jail cells for the rest of their lives. Indeed, their capture has been a wonderful tool in manipulating the public sphere and managing or mangling the perception of responsible government. But there's little use in keeping them alive to whimper pathetically in their cells, rotting away as they howl tears of despair. It is far too expensive, so our chief executive has authorized and ordered to lodge a bullet between their eyes. Their submission has outlived its use, and so, too, they will follow suit. But, unfortunately, I'm going to end the episode right there. If you enjoyed the video, though, leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow to see what else we can do with Guangdong and not piss everyone off. Thanks for watching. Have a tremendous Kamai Kinichiro rest of your day.